Yes, uh, Mirk and I have uh, worked on this project, uh, Dynamic Distributions, uh, for some uh, years now, where we work on the material from southeastern Norway. That is because south southeastern Norway is the area that our museum, the Museum of Cultural History, is responsible for. So we have all the archaeological artifacts from this area. Uh, we worked on uh, single finds like axes, sickles, daggers from the Stone Age in the, uh, over the last three years. And now we have also started to look at sites with other types of material, so all, all the way from Stone Age. So what we will uh, talk about today is the visualization of the database, the museum database, distribution analysis in a vertical perspective, forest and tree limits, and the uh, open data baseline for further research. So the <coughs> online museum database uh, is um, the result of a national cooperation among the five archaeological museums in Norway. This is all the archaeological museums, so all the major archaeological collections in Norway can be queried through this page. Uh, at present, more than 985,000 entries from the database are published online, and uh, the published Stone Age finds from our museum counts more than 82,000. The museums use this database for cataloging all new acquisitions to, in the museums, so the number of entries are constantly increasing. During the last year, the total number has increased with 125,000, and the Stone Age entries from our museum increased with 18,000. This, uh, this page makes the information available to the general public. Researchers can appreciate that it is possible to download the results as an Excel file, and the download has information about each object along with coordinates for the site. It is also possible to see the sites on the map and create distribution maps for selected clients. This uh, image shows the first 10,000 hits of the query on the last page. Uh, it is too much information. It's like what uh, Christian Mill talked about this morning, that it's good to have a lot of information, but when you have too much information unstructured, it not, it's not helpful. So what we need to do is then to look at these maps in other ways. This is an example of how one uh, one post in the database, one object is presented with some basic information and then also with the original catalogue text down at the bottom. We have here an example of uh, um, uh, sites in how the sites are presented in the database. Uh, we have uh, different precision levels. Most of the sites have a precision level of the cadastral unit. That means that we know which farm it was found on, but not more precisely like that than that. We have uh, the, the precise site information for some objects, and for some we have even less precise information. This is because the finds have come to the museum since the, mu the museum started in 1829, and uh, the early finds we very often have the <coughs> cadastral unit, uh, some finds, especially those coming to the museum through other collections, we have even less information about. And then, <clears throat> when we have geotagged the artifacts, we had to make some decisions. How can we present all this on a map without being unprecise, without giving a picture that is wrong? We made a decision that when we have the cadastral unit, we use a coordinate for the main houses on the farm. Because most of the time, uh, the find will will have been done close to the houses. People move around most close to the house, not so much up in the mountains or in the forests, but close to the house. And that's why we chose that as a coordinate. And when we publish this, we publish it with the precision level, so that when you do an analysis, you can use this as metadata and say that, now I want to look at a map of all of Norway, the spread of um, late Stone Age axis, and then when you have all of Norway on one page, you can use also those with less precise information. But when you want to see what artifacts have been found close to a river on certain types of soil, you can't use those, then you have to use only those with site precision level. We have worked uh, with uh, this uh, exploratory data analysis. 
And uh, well, you should try to see the whole, you should simplify and abstract, divide and group, and involve the main knowledge. Uh, it's also called the cartographic research method, where you start with a map of the world, and then you uh, prepare data for mapping, you map them, and then you get some more information, and then you use that again for the new map, and then you can go around this circle sometimes, and gradually getting more understanding of, uh, of your material. This shows the Stone Age finds in our uh, museum district, mapped on five different uh, landscape areas. Down on the, in the corner here is uh, Professor Gustafsson in the first Stone Age exhibition in the Historical Museum building from uh, 1904. Um, when we go out to the Viking Ship Museum later today, we will see his uh, diaries from the excavation of the Ulsbad ship, which he did from uh, uh, 04 and 05. Um, luckily, he was able to complete the first exhibition before the Viking ship took all his attention. <laughs> so here is uh, the site distribution mapped on uh, uh, different height levels. And uh, on the left you have uh, the uh, single finds that we worked with uh, earlier, and on the right side you have the sites. And in uh, uh, the different uh, classes here is five different size levels uh, from a number of uh, objects on each site. And one can see that there is, of course, a great concentration around the Oslo fjord, and um, uh, you have more spears, you have the, the um, finds, more or less thin but uh, evenly distributed up in the higher areas and there is a clear difference between this and this uh, site distribution. When we look at the height profile for this area uh, we see that it's very steep in the mountains from the mountains in the west and then gradually being more flat when you come down towards the fjords towards the Oslo region. Uh, we have today a tree line in Norway at around 900 meters above sea level in, in this area. And it is then also a, a line between the moose in the forest and then the reindeer up in the mountains. And one has always thought of the what can you live on in the high mountains, so that would be the reindeer. And uh, this is uh, also here you can see what we mean with the forest and tr the tree limits. Uh, the um, forest limit is where you have the, the change from the dense forest. You should have groups of at least 15 trees. Above that you have more sparse trees and then later it goes over into only shrubs. And um, this is um, uh, of course a, a gradual change from the dense forest and up into the, the high mountains. Uh, the Stone Age site distribution and the tree limits shows that most Stone Age sites are actually below uh, the tree limit at the time that they, they were um, uh, used. Uh, we have different tree limits on the west coast and on the, in eastern Norway in the mountains. The red line here is the tree limit for the mountains and you can see the dots underneath here being the Stone Age sites. And uh, most of them are below this tree line at any time. Why this is important is that when we look at the Stone, um, stone Age sites in the high mountains today, we will think that this is, you get an impression that this is how it has always been. That the sites were up in the high mountains and they had to rely on reindeer hunts. But then in reality, when you look at the tree limit, you will see that no, this wasn't high mountain sites, it was forest sites. And when you look at Hardangelvidda, uh, an area in mid-south Norway, you will also see that most of the uh, sites are below these old tree lines. Uh, the Mesolithic sites, only a couple, about 1240 meters, and also the Neolithic sites, you find very few at such high levels that they were, in fact, above the tree limit. And then, when we turn to the Lardal Mountains. This is how it looks today. And the green areas is uh, the modern tree limit at 900 meters above sea level. And uh, when we 
move to the situation which was during most of the Stone Age with a tree limit of 1400 meters above sea level. You can see that almost all the sites are within the, uh, the forest. It's um, uh, around most of the lakes that are Stone Age sites. Uh, one could think that, well, this is because the people were looking at, for sites around the lakes and not in the area around. But there is actually, down on the left here, a few lakes that also were surveyed uh, intensively. And uh, uh, those who were up there, they didn't find any sites, and that made them look even harder. But it, so it, it actually must be without any, any, any sites. And uh, when you try to find an explanation, you can see that the lakes down on the left, they are actually higher. So they are above this old tree limit. And uh, one more picture, how about we do today? And here is the site distribution. And again, the green areas is the wooded areas. And it's clear to see that there is a connection between these two things. Now, uh, we have uh, said that we will look at the finds and sites in the vertical distribution. And uh, these are again uh, the sites in these three countries, that, uh, counties, <laughs> that we started with. And uh, again on the left you have the single finds, and on the right you have the sites. And uh, this time it's divided in, in three uh, groups according to the size of the, the sites. And uh, again we notice this high density around the Oslo Fjord, and also that the distribution of sites and, uh, and single finds are different to the left, which is up in the high mountains. Uh, one can see some uh, concentrations there in the highest area of, of sites and, and very few uh, single finds, actually. Now, when we return to the landscape types, we can see that the single finds are in the valleys. It's on the uh, around the fjord, in the woods, and in the valleys towards the mountain, but not so much uh, in that left part. While the sites are all, there are hardly any sites in these valley areas. And uh, that is uh, surprising in a way, but then there are a lot of modern factors also guiding this uh, distribution pattern. Because what is happening around the Oslo Fjord is, of course, uh, a lot of road construction. We have railway lines being built, a lot of modern activity, making a lot of archaeological uh, excavations. And uh, the big sites up in the mountains are all connected to um, hydroelectrical power, which we did a lot in the 1950s and 60s, and that is why you have the large sites up there. But nevertheless, it's interesting that there are so few, uh, so few uh, single finds, meaning datable artifacts, up on the on the left map, up in this uh, high mountain region. Uh, this is a first step in uh, this second phase of our project, where we also look at the, the site distribution, and uh, since we are doing this on a very course scale, we have included all uh, artifact uh, precision levels. So we have a rather large material that we show on these, uh, these maps. In the later part of this uh, project, we will then extend the area to more counties, and we will also work to have better precision on as many uh, finds and sites as possible, and then see how this uh, uh, this image of what we can get out from, from looking at the, the maps. And then, of course, uh, all of these data are freely available for everyone. So when we do an update on precision levels or do a recataloging of the, of the artifacts, we do that directly into the museum database. So that uh, the, the online version is updated once a week, 
So within a week, everyone can go in and see the recent results from our work on these Stone Age uh, artifacts. So, and that is a very important thing with this, that we uh, make the information, the geotagged artifacts, available for as many people as possible, so that anyone actually can download the data sets and do their own analysis on the material. Well, thank you.